Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 237, featuring the fifth and final installment of my interview with Miss Brenda Romero. In this final section, we talk about the importance of video games for teaching and also the importance of video game history, why we should know about and care about the developers and designers who make all of these things possible. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Ms. Brenda Romero. Okay, so I saw your TED talk about your uh, non-digital games, and I mean, that's really powerful stuff. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you decided to go into the non-digital uh, realm for those, and then also, how do you deal with those people that say, you know, you really shouldn't be making a game about these topics. This is, you know, a serious topic. Because I imagine that must come up pretty pretty frequently. Um, it, you know, it actually, it comes up a lot less than you'd think. Um, I, you know, I think there's the initial shock. Like, non-digital stuff doesn't have this, it doesn't have quite the same level of stigma. Like, a, you know, for instance, a video game like Super Columbine Massacre, right? A video game... You know, people hear, you made a video game about what? Um, when News of Train first got out, there was some of that, but it wasn't as, it wasn't as, uh, it wasn't as pronounced as it would have been if it were a video game. And I think, you know, the, the, great, the, the great advantage that games have is they can, they can make history dynamic. So every event in human history that was human on human, wars, movements of people, whatever, there's a system behind that. And that's what games do, they're systems. And so there's two ways to explore a system. You can either just talk about it and here's a pile of facts and please retain the pile of facts, or you can actually see that system moving. Um, just like with science, like I could stand at the front of the room and I could say, if you take this and you put these things together, something will happen. Or I could show you, or even better, I could let you do it. Um, I could have you read books endlessly, or maybe I could have you actually write a paper so you get the process of forming an idea. In games, games are just another vehicle for that. Uh, and, and games have the tremendous benefit of, of actually allowing us to put ourselves in history. And in the case of my games, it started, not like I was planning to make these things, right? But it started with my daughter coming home from school, having talked about the Middle Passage. And she, uh, when I asked her what, what they had done that school that day, you know, she, Middle Passage, and she said, well, we talked about the Middle Passage. And, and she seemed to have just like such a view of it that was so light and so trivial. Like, you know, can you explain it to me, honey? And so she did, and, and she said all the words like, all the things that the teachers had wanted her to learn. She could check every one of those boxes. But the fact, like, you know, this is a kid who's, who, for, for whom some of her heritage is, is African, right? And, and so she talked about it with just such a degree of levity that, that it shocked me as a parent. So when she asked if she could play a game, clearly meaning something on the PS2, I made that game on the spot because I felt like she needed to, under, she just didn't get it and she needed to understand um, what had happened. And so she painted, you know, I asked her to make me a bunch of families and because she had spent time with them, because, because she had actually considered it, you know, she was considering it as a, as, as these people now granted they're tremendous abstractions of people, they're painted wooden figures. But because she had, um, she had spent time with it and she thought of it as something outside of these posters and books and facts that had been recited to her. When she was done her experience, and this is after a whole month of black history, she said, mommy, did this really happen? And maybe it was because she was seven and, and they, didn't, they didn't lay in some of the heavier facts of slavery and some of the, some of the treatment of Africans um, you know, on the Middle Passage, which is what the game was about. Um, and, and she was just blown away by it, but a game made history real for her because it was boiled down, not like, you know, not the one million facts that you could potentially learn, right? But it was like, it was distilled down to its purest essence. Um, and she could see the horrible system that allowed this to happen in the first place. And that's something that only games can do only games. Now a book can write about it, but you can't make a book move. You can't make it, you can't see the system. Um, 
And so this is the tremendous luxury and gift that games have to education. Uh, in, you know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe, nah, man, it's not even that long ago. But nowadays, I think educators are thinking in terms of what can games do? What can games, how can we use games to educate kids? And, and while in the early, uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s, a whole flotilla of crap educational software came out that really um, made people think like, oh, no, no, let's just, let's just stay away from educational games. And from the industry side, that's not going to make us any money. And then from the parent side, well, those are crap games. And why would I ever put those in front of my kids? But, but that's changing. You know, there's the, the, the um, it is very common, you know, for a parent nowadays, oh, you know, my, like me, I mean, my, you know, my kid needs to learn whatever. Okay. Well, I wonder if there's a game that can help reinforce that. It just becomes part of my parenting arsenal and educating my children. Um, and so to me, it's just in the last, since I, since I started these games um, in 2008, there's been a radical change between then and now. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, I, I feel like it's important that, that games are made about these things. I, you know, and I don't know why, like, if you like, why do you feel it's important? I don't know. I just, I just feel like I have to make these games. I feel like I have to. All right, so just a couple last things here. One, I saw a post of yours, a blog post, and it really you know, spoke to me because it's a lot of what's, a lot of what I, I dedicate myself to. But you, uh, the question in the blog post was, who directed Star Wars? <laughs> you know, thinking about the absurdity of people who yeah. you know, claim to know a lot about movies but wouldn't know a question like that. But, you know, I agree. It seems like any time I talk to anybody who's a gamer, they can't name anybody involved in the industry at all. It's just like they they don't even realize all this fascinating stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So... You know, what are your, th I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Why, why is that? Um, well, you know, in the at early on, EA actually had an ad, which is you know, you want to, about wanting to be a game design rock star, um, and was very much about promoting its developers. But how do you how do you promote? Um, you know, like let's just think of some gigantic teams, like like who is World of Warcraft? You know, who is Red Dead Redemption? With, with games getting to the size they are and companies not wanting to glorify their individual people, um, you know, for some reasons, like, like I remember, I've worked for game companies that didn't want to send their employees to GDC for fear that they would get sniped. Um, I know of, um, you know, companies who, who don't want to just associate one person with a project lest they, uh, lest that one person um, end up wanting a ton of money, which which has happened in the game industry. And also, you know, like, man, what game developer would want to have their, their name on a box? Because, you know, the game industry kills its, kills its successes, right? You know, like, if you're successful in, in the game industry, you will get, you know, you will get the, the hell beaten out of you on social media, uh, as is evidenced by, pretend I just said a long list of game developers to whom that's happened. Um, so we, you know, that we don't do that. Uh, and, and it's companies want to, they want to raise the value of the IP and they want to raise the value of their own name. And so there's zero incentive for them to raise the value of individual developers. And that's something that developers have to do themselves. So, you know, I, interestingly enough, while working on Jagged Alliance, I remember Sean Ling said to me, always fight for the credits. And I have, you know, I've, I've always fought to make sure um, that our games have credits and that, you know, in fact, it's in with Loot Drop, the fact that there will be game credits is in every one of our contracts, which may seem like, why would you even put that in a contract? But how many social games actually have game credits in them? How many mobile games have game credits? Um, and I think, so that's one part, but I think on the other part, it's also just not, it's not taught, um, it's not taught in game development programs. Like there's no way you're gonna get through uh, an art degree, um, even as a painter without taking art history. And, but we don't study that. Like, and we're missing, like, and the, the thing that's terrifying about it, and, you know, John's doing a series of interviews with, uh, with game developers. Um, the thing that's terrifying to me about it is that we are literally right now living in the age of our Mozarts. They're alive right now. We could interview them right now. And some of the work that Jason Scott is doing, you know, going around and talking to people, 
that's that's critically important in some of the like amazing stories that exist at the foundation of this industry. Um, you know, like for instance, Nasser Jabelli. Do you know who Nasser is? Sure. Okay, good, good. Then the interview can continue. <laughs> so Nasser, one of my favorite stories about Nasser is Nasser actually programmed directly into the mini assembler. And Nasser, for those who don't know, Nasser Jabelli, um, if you're an old gamer man, you remember programmed by Nasser. Programmed by Nasser was just Programmed by Nasser meant something, right? And Nasser was super badass. He's a sole coder of Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3. And he programmed directly into the mini assembler and he had no source code, which meant that he had to remember the entire game in his brain, which apparently he could do for, uh, for about two weeks. Uh, and, and it all had to get in at that point in time. Like, that's superhuman. There's this other dude, Larry Miller. Wait, Larry Miller? I want to say, I think it's Larry Miller. Larry Miller used to um, dictate his code to his secretary, who they would then go to the publisher, where she would type all of his code in, and it would work. <laughs> what? Um, and, and there's other stories like that. Like, I, I had the luxury, you know, John and Tom Hall gave a talk on, uh, on Doom, did a postmortem on Doom at GDC. And so everybody else heard a talk. But I get to hear the real talk. Like, I get to hear what they were talking about while they were putting that stuff together and saying, like, oh, no, no, we can't put that in there. That's just, right? And so, like, I actually got to hear it, and I wish, and I think back now, like, somebody should have recorded that conversation because, like, you know, and, you know, maybe some of that stuff should just <laughs> never be never be released. But so what was some of that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> maybe ask John. Um, uh, there's, there was, there's a whole talk that could have been given about the talk, the preparing of the talk, um, you know, and just like, oh, just crazy shit. Um, but they, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the industry about that, that game developers have to offer other people, you know, studying like one of my, just so, like, I, I haven't yet met Nasser Javelli, but I will because he and John are friends. But like when I met Bill Budge, like Bill Budge, oh, Bill Budge is a superhero, you know. And when I met Bill Budge, it, it remains, it remains one of the, you know, the most funny experiences. I he was at, it was a glass walled restaurant, and he was walking up to the restaurant, and I was so excited to see this hero of mine that I stood up, and when I I stood up, and I was like, oh my God, it's Bill Budge. God knows why I started applauding. Mind you, he's still outside the restaurant, so this is the key part. And when I stood up, my chair tipped over, my metal chair tipped over on the concrete floor. So just imagine that you're eating in this restaurant and this woman starts up, stands up and goes, oh my God, it's Bill Budge. And my chair tips over and I'm applauding. And there's no, like, clearly I look insane, right? And then he came in and Bill is the most humble man in games, you know? He and, and Sid Meier, I think, are tied for that role. And, uh, it was really pretty wild. It was, it, and still to this day, like I, I can't meet Bill Budge and not go, oh my God, it's Bill Budge. Um, but I, I feel it's important that, that, you know, that we would give anything to, to go back and interview Mozart. We would give anything to go back and interview people who, you know, the early filmmakers, right? And we are at the beginning of this, this medium of, of video games. Well, we're not at the beginning, we're 40 now, right? But, but still, those people are still alive, like like Slug Russell's Space War is still alive. Why? And, and thank goodness the Computer History Museum has done a bunch of oral histories with him. John, um, John has done a bunch of oral histories with the Computer History Museum. But there are so many more game designers that we just don't we just don't know about. And people, you know, and it's not even a question of an of an ego thing. There are plenty of things that I wish people would forget about me. <laughs> plenty of things. Um, and so it's not so much that, it's that these people are still alive. And, and you know, I, I did, uh, when I was working on uh, my master's degree, I did a lot of study of Jackson Pollock. And there's a lot of stuff we just don't know about Pollock. And I wish we did know. So, so there are students that aren't even born yet who are going to be studying things that we're just letting go into the dustbin of history. Um, and even as an industry, we're absolutely shitty in keeping our, you know, like, in keeping our our history thinking like, oh, there could be value to this. Like when Wizardry 8 was finished, if I know where a couple of the design docs are because I kept them. The others were just like, well, okay, we're done with this game. Garbage. Um, you know, John is a, he's not a 
he's not a pack rat by any stretch of the imagination, but he's kept to everything. He's got source code to every single game with the exception of a few where the discs were stolen. But he's got the source code to everything he ever wrote. He's got the design notes for everything he ever wrote. He's got every letter he ever sent to any company from the time he was a little kid. Um, he's got all of it. Uh, and, but he's really rare. So you know, he, Steve Moretzky, Jordan Mechner, um, you know, not a ton of designers have done that. And most of us, we just get rid of it. Blizzard has started, Blizzard now has, has uh, begun quite a beautiful archiving process. In fact, when you go to Blizzard, they have, they have a, a, an exhibit in a changing little museum there. So, so game developers are now starting to realize that, but in many cases, a lot of that early stuff is just being flushed out. Um, people like Henry Lowitt are doing a lot of work, uh, you know, about you know, talking about video game preservation and, you know, how do you actually, um, well, if I didn't say Henry Lowitt at Stanford, you know, how do you, how do you archive these, these digital worlds? How will, you know, which require thousands of players? Like, what is World of Warcraft? How will we show people World of Warcraft a thousand years from now? Because games must be lived to be experienced. You know, so there's a lot of challenges, but I, I do feel it's sad that, that programmed by Nasser is not known by more people. And I, when I, I taught the class um, about games and I remember saying, I remember showing, oh, what did I show? I think I showed Guernica, Picasso's Guernica. And then I think I showed, um, I showed Pollock and I showed a Rothko and probably uh, Michelangelo, something. But the students, you know, like they could name every single one. They knew who those artists were. And then I showed four video games, um, World of Warcraft and uh, whatever else was popular, super popular at the time. And I didn't know, like, who's the lead designer? No idea. And I say, so, but this is your calling. So you can actually tell me who painted Guernica. <laughs> you can tell me who painted Guernica, but you don't know who is the lead designer of World of Warcraft. But yet you're telling me that more than anything, you love video games and you want to go into this. Really? Um, and I know for me, studying the work of game designers, studying their patterns and studying the things that they tend to do in games is very valuable to me as a game designer. Um, you know, like I've, you know, I've taken a look, like a lot of, I studied Reiner Knizia's stuff. He's a board game designer for a very long time. Not digital, it's not just board game. Um, uh, you know, I, one of my favorite books is uh, The Oxford History of Board Games. You know, there's just genius. Open the cover, genius, close the cover. Um, you know, so I, I study the work of game designers uh, and, and that proves very, very useful to me. And I know it would prove useful to other people because I'm not the only one for whom this has been a good thing. But it's just not something that we teach now, and, and I don't know why. Well, thanks so much, uh, Brenda, for taking the time out to do this interview with me. Is there any, or do you have any final thoughts or anything that we, you wanted to cover that we didn't get to? Mm. No, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, all in all, I... I would say I, I'm super honored. I mean, this is like a whole ton of time. I'm surprised if anybody will listen to this whole thing. And I'm super honored that you asked to interview me. Um, you know, all in all, I, I feel like there's, you know, that I'm, that I'm really lucky. I mean, I've got a pretty great life and I get to make games. I talk about games all the time. You know, I'm married to a game developer. Uh, I'm, sh <laughs> you know, it's, it's all games all the time. Um, and if anybody, if there were anybody who were thinking about breaking into games and really wondering how to do it, I, they're welcome to contact me. You know, I'm, I'm really easy to find. I'm just at VR on Twitter. And you have a whole book about breaking into the games industry. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, the, gonna, it's kind of funny. I forgot that I wasn't going to plug that. But, you know, so sure, okay, if you want to read the book, go ahead. Um, but, you know, if you, have, if you have any questions, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm pretty easy to reach. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoys, enjoyed that. As you probably know, it's Easter here at the Map Cave. Uh, I've got some Easter eggs behind me. If you want to find those, I actually posted a little hidden object game I built with Game Maker at matchshot.us. Uh, so go ahead and uh, head over there, try it out, see if you can find all five of these eggs. And 
Uh, it'll play a little match hat ditty for you if you get all five. So have fun with that. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much if you have supported my efforts to keep these interviews and retrospectives going. If you would like to become a member of Matt Chat, just go to uh, the Patreon site listed at the bottom of the, uh, this episode show notes over at Patreon, Black Lily 8. Uh, you can sign up for any amount you want, and the bonus is a free monthly audio podcast that's only available to Patreon subscribers. A lot of great stuff coming up with that, too, so stay tuned. Uh, let's see. I got a lot of news here. Actually, enough to fill up two cards. I'll try to make this brief. Uh, first, Andre uh, Votus wrote in about Sacred Fire, a turn-based narrative RPG, RPG that integrates story and gameplay by using the character emotions in both the combat and dialogue. Had a look at that. Uh, seems pretty interesting. You know, it's always been one of the weaknesses, I think, of a lot of RPGs. You know, they do a good job with the combat and the environment, but not so much with the uh, emotional side of everything. So that looks pretty interesting. Uh, also, Jeff Williams. Uh, you may remember him from uh, the Dark Star series we had on Match Hat. He's uh, launched a Kickstarter called Everything a Film. So he's doing, he's moved from the game world into film. Uh, this is a psychological thriller with dark comedy elements. Looks pretty good. Uh, go check that out. And then finally, Robert Gervais has uh, told me about From Where She Dreams, a 2D point and click adventure game uh, where you play an eight year old girl looking for her lost journal. So, how to look at that's pretty fun dialogue uh, and voice acting in that. All right, and then that's not all. I also have a special ale selection. Uh, this is a uh, from uh, Masochus. He sent me the best CRPG ever, uh, Ultima 7 right there behind me, and also uh, this bottle of ale. This is a Krabby's Original Alcoholic Ginger Beer, and it comes out of the UK, and there's lots of stuff on the bottle. They actually put a little cardboard dress on the top. I guess that's a halter top. I don't know what to call that. Uh, anyway, this is a little story here. So Scottish merchant adventurer John Crabby imported the ginger from the Far East into the ancient port of Leith, Edinburgh in 1801. Over 200 years later, our distinctive elephant trademark still celebrates our heritage and pioneering past. Following a secret guarded recipe with a steep real ginger for up to eight weeks, combined with spices and citrus for a unique and refreshing alcohol ginger beer enjoyed around the world. So as you know, I'm a big fan of ginger beers. I've never had an alcoholic one though, so this will be interesting. Uh, looks good. Uh, so anyway, thank you uh, very much, Masochist. Let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this, uh, ah, it smells good. Uh, some of this uh, Krabby's uh, alcoholic ginger beer here in this rather excellent drinking horn. You know, they went on all over that bottle about how you're supposed to serve this in a glass with ice and a slice of lemon, but uh, we're just gonna have to settle for the drinking horn. You know, just the idea of beer and ice uh, just kind of freaks me out. Uh, this smells really, really, really nice. You definitely smell the ginger in this. Very sweet. You can smell some citrusy uh, stuff too. Maybe they added a little bit of uh, orange peel or maybe some lemon rind to this. Uh, very aromatic. It smells really good. No alcohol fumes. I think it's got something like 4.8% alcohol, so fairly low uh, amount of alcohol. So not really expecting a big uh, alcoholic taste anyway, but uh, definitely smells great. Uh, so let's give it a taste. <laughs> okay, now that is uh, something new. I haven't tasted anything like that. Uh, I kind of get this apricot like taste, like a dried apricot uh, fruit. Bit of a, a little bit of the ginger. The ginger is not as strong as I thought it might be. Um, a little bit of heat, like you would get with some of those stronger uh, non alcoholic ginger beers. Kind of a raisin uh, current taste to this. Let me try it again. Very sweet, uh, tasting a little bit of plum in here as well. A very fruity, um, very fruity, sweet, uh, almost like a, it tastes more like a non-alcoholic ginger. You can't even taste the alcohol in this. Let me just put it that way. Uh, just a really good flavor on this. I'm gonna try it one more time. Uh, 
Yeah, just excellent stuff here. Very uh, crisp, refreshing. Kind of reminds me uh, of a, like a really, really awesome Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you, know, you can imagine uh, that sort of Dr. Pepper taste that you like, but uh, the good the good sides of that flavor ratcheted, uh, ratcheted up. A little bit of ginger in there, maybe a little bit of a prune taste. Uh, just really, really solid apple. I love Dr. Pepper, love ginger beer. So this is really hitting all of my uh, favorite taste uh, sensors in my tongue and brain. Anyway, fantastic. Uh, without a doubt, if you like ginger beer, uh, you definitely want to check this one out. I'm not actually aware of any other alcoholic ginger beers. I guess there must be a bunch. Uh, this is the first time I've had one, though. Uh, so just as far as my impressions, a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, very, very tasty. Uh, thank you very much, Masticus, for this. A uh, Krabby's ginger beer. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotations from uh, great teachers. I found one from Quintilian. And this has a certain uh, resonance uh, today, even though this was said in 95 AD. The child who is not yet old enough to love his studies should not be allowed to come to hate them. His studies must be made an amusement. See you guys next week. Jack, Jack, now calm down. Calm down, he's gone. The rabbit's gone.